So in March 2024, a brand new systematic review was published regarding ketamine treatment for major depression. So it's a good time to talk about pros and cons of ketamine. Now first, it might surprise you, but I'm not a big believer in taking systematic reviews at face value and just accepting everything they say. Some are excellent, but some are terrible. Just like some construction contractors are excellent and some are terrible. The problem is review articles often have hidden agendas, like when the American Heart Association publishes a review that confirms what they've supposedly always known, that saturated fat, animal fat, is bad for you, even though your ancestors ate it for thousands of years with no heart disease in hunter-gathering tribes. But ever since Crisco was invented from industrial waste cotton seed oil, you should suddenly start eating loads of seed oils in your diet. The unfortunate thing is, it can be hard to recognize hidden agendas without a deep look into the research or an investigation into the authors writing the review, or the lone author in some cases, not just authors. Remember, some people think of science as a religion, and they read these things like religious proclamations. Ask people to give you three problems with vaccines and you'll learn quickly that some people will immediately start calling you names for your blasphemous questioning of their religious faith and the religion of science. Basically, you'll find out who believes in science with the capital S, science as a religion, or who's approaching it from a critical thinking perspective by asking about vaccines. It's a great litmus test. Attacks on me, quite frankly, are attacks on science. So systematic reviews. They are usually designed with the sole purpose of selling more patented pharmaceuticals or medical products, or their sole purpose is propping up someone's research to secure more government grant funding. Those are the real motivations to write these things. Number one, money, or number two, money. It's not a charitable donation donation of someone's time. They want more government grant money or they want to sell prescription drugs, usually. And even if systematic reviews are well-intentioned or well-researched, and plenty of them are well-researched, systematic reviews overlook a ton of nuance. But these review studies create a lot of mainstream buzz, so I feel like it's worth going through this one and talking about ketamine generally. So, this new 2024 systematic review only included 14 studies, which seems really sparse for a systematic review. Better than nothing, but certainly not massive. Ketamine, by the way, has been around in research. It's been used in research since the 1960s. So you'd think we could pull together more than 14 studies. Uh, but ketamine wasn't making anyone money until recently, very recently, so it was largely ignored. Plus, it's been hitting pop culture with people like Whitney Cummings and Theo Vaughn talking about it. So it's gaining mainstream attention. And ketamine clinics are popping up where people are using it. So it's important to understand. Anyway, this systematic review here found that ketamine and S-ketamine show large antidepressant effects. S-ketamine, in case you wonder, is literally just an, anti an antimer of ketamine, meaning the ketamine molecule is right and left-handed, and the S-ketamine is just the left-handed version of ketamine, while ketamine is the combination of both left and right-handed molecules. It's just chemistry. And the reason people are doing studies with S-ketamine is because it's the patented money-making, FDA-approved drug version of regular ketamine. I warned you, money is always involved somehow. It's money or it's money. So anyways, S-ketamine is obviously the real reason ketamine is suddenly popular. It's not Whitney Cummings or Theo Vaughn. The drug companies behind the scenes have unbelievable influence on the media and on influencers, and they make sure this stuff hits mainstream. And I'm not saying Theo Vaughn or Whitney are being paid by drug companies, but I'm confident that some influencers definitely are. So S-ketamine. The actual S-ketamine drug is called Spravato, and it's owned by J&J. &J. Just think of it as the exact same thing as regular ketamine for the purpose of this study. So looking at ketamine, they found large antidepressant effects, but what else? They also noted that the placebo response accounted for up to 72% of the overall treatment response, which is crazy. So this made me wonder, what on earth were they giving people in place of ketamine? These treatments were nasal spray. So if you had someone shoot water up their nose, obviously they would know they're not using ketamine just based on how they feel after using that nasal spray. So how are they tricking people into thinking 
they're using ketamine when they're not. To find the answer, I had to dig into the actual 14 studies, including this really good ketamine review study, which was randomized, double-blinded, and placebo-controlled. And the first thing I learned from looking at the original studies, not just the systematic review of the 14 studies, was there's a massive dropout in the placebo groups. This particular study had 22.2% participant dropout. That means people weren't being fooled by, by the placebos in many cases. And this is clearly going to skew the results in all the studies, but it gets worse. Almost all the ketamine studies use midazolam as a placebo, which is literally a benzodiazepine. So they're, they're really comparing a benzo to ketamine to see which one works better. They're not really doing placebo-controlled trials. They're calling them placebo-controlled trials. It sounds really good, but that's not what this is. This happens often in research, actually. People say the placebo effect is massive, and then you find out that the placebo is a benzo, benzodiazepine rather than just sugar water, which is how most people think about placebo-controlled trials. They think they're using sugar water. For a parallel example here, uh, if you're gonna do studies on drunk driving and alcohol consumption, you'd probably compare people that drink alcoholic beer versus people that drank non-alcoholic beer and have them drive around an obstacle course and see their response times. If you did that, I would say right on. That's a good comparison, right? That's a solid placebo controlled comparison. Assuming you're brewing those beers in the same way and when you remove the alcohol, you're not adding any weird chemicals like benzos to the non-alcoholic beer. The problem with comparing benzos and ketamine is benzodiazepines are often used for treating depression and anxiety, so it's no longer a placebo controlled experiment. I'm not blaming anyone here, by the way because I'm not sure you can actually do a placebo-controlled trial with ketamine. It's just too obvious for people when they are getting the real deal. But my issue here is they still call these studies placebo-controlled trials, which tricks people. So what these studies are actually finding is that ketamine helps people with major depression, and midazolam also helps people with major depression, but midazolam has a higher dropout rate. It doesn't work as well as ketamine and it's riskier for causing a dangerous long-term addiction compared to ketamine. And you can't even find studies on midazolam alone for the treatment of depression. It's always used in conjunction with ketamine. So we don't know much about the proper dosing and the side effects and a lot of nuance with midazolam. That's why I said in the beginning, systematic reviews often overlook nuance. So you can't take them at face value. And they often are pushing something that produces profits, in this case, S-ketamine, also called Spravato. Now, one thing that should always be mentioned in the topic of depression is the gut. The gut provides approximately 95% of total body serotonin, and most people with major depression have major gut issues arising from extremely poor diets in relation to what their ancestors ate for thousands of years, meaning our ancestors ate simple, whole foods that are unprocessed, and they regularly ate unprocessed animal products like meats and bone broth. They also exercised continuously throughout the day. And exercise helps improve gut health for a number of reasons, including vagus nerve stimulation. Everyone's different in their needs for optimizing gut health. That's why I do DNA consulting. But gut health, gut health should be the main focus of the research here for major depression. Gut health. The focus shouldn't be on some artificial quick fix intervention. Even though fixing your diet and gut issues by eating healthy whole foods and exercising, that doesn't sell drugs. It should be the focus. When governments are funding studies, it should mainly be studies focused on things that pharma companies will not study because drugs are not involved. Yet, it's backwards. Most of the NIH funded research in America has historically been focused on supporting the big pharma companies by focusing research on drug interventions. For example, where are the carnivore diet studies? There should be hundreds. Hopefully the new NIH director, Monica Berg, uh, Bertig, Bertignoli, Bertig, Bertignoli, hopefully she'll make some changes. Cancer treatments keep going up, but so do overall cancer rates. This is literally a graph of cancer prevalence since 1975, and this is a graph of cancer drugs in development as well as cancer drugs that are approved. 
In other words, it appears the more drugs we approve, the higher cancer rates seem to climb. It's like everything else in health. Get back to what your ancestors are doing, ignore the money-making propaganda, or you're in line for some hard lessons about the modern medical system. Anyway, ketamine might be a temporary treatment option that should be used as a tool in your toolbox if you need it, but the long-term strategy should be fixing the root causes rather than making J&J &J richer with something that continuously suppresses your executive brain function like esketamine. And going back to the 2024 systematic review, ketamine definitely has a high response rate in major depression at about 32%, which is obviously even better than midazolam. So I don't want to ignore ketamine as a tool, but I want people to think about exercise and diet first and foremost. Everything else is secondary. Low vitamin D over and over and over has been found in people with depression. And people with the lowest vitamin D have the greatest risk of depression. And sure enough, People with higher vitamin D have stronger gut linings, a lower incidence of irritable bowel disease and Crohn's disease, severe gut issues. This is all very predictable stuff. Once you start ignoring uh, the drug interventions and start paying attention to gut health, eating whole foods, including animal products, exercising, spending time outdoors in the sunshine, things your ancestors did for thousands of years, your health starts to improve. In conclusion, it is worth mentioning that other ketamine reviews that encompass less extreme versions of depression, they also find ketamine has benefits. For example, this Cochrane review, and anytime I mention Cochrane, it's basically mandatory for me to say, never forget, when Instagram literally censored Cochrane's full-time professional researchers from even being mentioned on Instagram because they published a study that showed masks were useless for COVID-19. I've done other videos on that too, in case you're interested. So that's a good place to end. Uh, ketamine is a useful tool. Money has brought this stuff back to life through Johnson & Johnson's Spravato. And a healthy diet, meaningful friendships, sunshine, sweating, and exercise should be your long-term investment strategy for preventing or fixing depression and staying healthy in every aspect of your life.